Uh, thank you, panelists, for joining me. Um, this, I think, is a really important debate to be had about the power of knowledge, about uh, how we utilize what we know to best effect. Uh, let's start with you, John Arna. You, you've just joined us. You're an internationally renowned public health expert. You're at the research, re, you run the Research Council of Norway. Do you fear that right now there is a tension between science and uh, the, the, the interpretation of science by people at all different levels, from ordinary folk living in their communities right through to politicians making uh, big political decisions. Uh, is, is science properly understood and communicated and appreciated? I think uh, maybe instead of s stating the obvious and say, yes, you're right, uh, I would probably rather say that we've never been in the point of time where science has been more important than now. And I think actually the role of science, the role of research, the role of solid knowledge um, has never had more impact on policy, on decisions, on business than today. So it's, 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 I, from my point of view, that is a continuously improving situation. That's a positive. That's a positive. But at the same time, even if that is improving, because it's even more important. I think it's actually the challenges we see when in many contexts, the politicians, the different interest groups, try to uh, not use that knowledge and, and try to state uh, um, sort of uh, other facts, other um, information as science. Uh, that challenges, but I, I would say it's a positive in the sense of the trend. I think we just need to continue that trend uh, but also continue it maybe in a different way than before. You said that we have had enough of experts, and I think... Well, I'm, to be fair, I, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it, but it was an interesting thing said by a politician in the UK who was not happy with the economic analysis that was being given about the uh, implications, sure. uh, long-term effects of Brexit. He just hated what he was hearing from the so-called experts and concluded we, the public, have had enough of experts. Yeah, and, and in a way that is partly right, because if experts, I think we can differentiate between experts and expertise and knowledge. And we shouldn't over rely on those naming themselves as experts. Uh, in, in my old field of public health and medicine, we, we have had actually, in many ways over the last 20 years, we had um, what I would say more of a democratization within medicine, relying less of the experts, but li relying more on expertise. Mm. We used to have the situation of the gobsat model, good old boys sitting around the table to decide. Mm. Uh, now I think the decisions in medicine, what, what is right for patients, what is the preferred um, treatment, it's much more of an engaged discussion, and it's much more of actually showing, show me the evidence. Let's discuss the evidence. Mm. Let's decide um, based on that together. And I think the way experts engage in society, the way experts or scientists engage, that's the crucial point. And I think well, we, if we don't engage correctly, we get politicians the way we see in some contexts. Yeah, talking of engagement, science engaging with the wider world, do you think scientists are good at communicating their messages? I, we, we can be better, definitely. And I, and I think what we, we have relied on potentially a, uh, an old model of disseminating science in the sense of, I will, I, I, I will tell you the facts, I will tell you the, the, the knowledge, and, and then you can act, and then you can sort of take your decision based on it. I think now we talk much more about communication, so a bi-directional uh, engagement between scientists and those that use science. Mm. And, and I think that is through the, the knowledge creation process. I think we need to engage citizens in what are the most important priorities? What, what, what should we do? What, is, what are the crucial issues that we should address as scientists? But I guess, uh, and I'm going to come to you now, Ingrid, I guess the, when you, you draw scientists into that broader arena, you, you run the risk of politicizing science. And, and it seems to me, if we are talking about uh, the debates we see around the world, which involve the use of science and data by politicians and campaigners, 
we, we sort of live in a world now where you have your facts and I have my facts and, and there's a dispute about whose facts are more meaningful or powerful. And I wonder, Ingrid, you work at WWF, it's, it's obviously an advocacy and campaigning organization. Do you worry sometimes that, that the public is losing faith in the sort of absolute value and the truth of so-called facts, you know, because it's all, it, it almost seems now like facts have been turned into weapons of, of opinion rather than just something we can all agree around. Mm. Well, I do, but I must say I don't really think that's a, a scientific problem. I think that's more a political problem. And I think you touched upon it uh, in, in your very introduction that there is a difference between information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And just look at the internet today, you have all this information over flooding all of us every day, but not all, not all of that is knowledge. Uh, not all of it is knowledge-based. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have uh, important knowledge, like the indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. uh, knowledge that isn't gathered and systematized in the way that traditional science is, and therefore is perhaps overlooked or not included into decision-making uh, the way it should be. Mm -hmm. So. I think that, especially perhaps here in the Arctic, we have some, some challenges that could be immediated. Um, but there, there are three factors I, I think are important. One is recognizing the knowledge that we don't have. Uh, our knowledge about the Arctic ecosystems is very inadequate. Uh, only a fraction of the species in the Arctic are included in the IUCN Red List. We don't know much. Uh, about the ecosystems. We do know a lot about climate change and the rapid pace uh, with which it's impacting these areas, but we don't know enough about the cascading effects it will have on the whole globe and our climate systems if we reach this tipping point. So recognizing that we don't, know have, uh, we don't have all the knowledge uh, and using that to advocate for a precautionary principle is quite a difficult thing to communicate because everybody would like to have clear answers, uh, my answers or your answers. And then I think in the Arctic states as well, there is um, gathering data is also a difficulty because different states are gathering and measuring data in different ways. So for example, how indigenous peoples are um, defined is different from different countries. How you uh, measure unemployment or how you measure economic activity, it differs, so it makes it difficult for scient to m scientists to make uh, good and inf information-based uh, recommendations that politicians can use. Uh, so that's also a, a form of lack of knowledge. And then you have politicians not heeding the knowledge that we do have. So for example, here in Norway, we see that we have Scientists, when they do come with very clear recommendations, all of us know that that means it's sort of 100% uh, science-backed because they are normally very cautious. Uh, so when they, for example, say, no, we shouldn't have oil developments in these areas, it's way too fragile, we know that it will have damaging effects, and we see that time and again politicians are not heeding that knowledge. That means that I think the public's respect of knowledge and science becomes diminished, and then you sort of come into... Uh, um, well, you come into the mess we have now with politicians saying that they're tired of experts. Yeah. I joined the discussion, yeah. And I think this, uh, for the, the thing that for the knowledge, there's a, a, a discussion about the, the, the true or not true, the correct or not correct. Mm. That's the, always the question. I, I think this question could not be ending. That's, the, that's why the, each uh, fact of the, the, each the sector of the science have their given condition. So if we put all the factors together, that's an uncertainty I have. So that's why IPCC bring all the uh, disciplinary scientists together, together mm -hmm. to try their best to, to find the trend, to find the logic. That's one thing. The other things about in which phase, in which phases, the knowledge can play the role. For example, in the first uh, phase that we call the uh, ideological phase, that's uh, we create value. The climate change issue is value. Environment protection is value. Mm -hmm. The scientists with their knowledge can create it with, by media, by the, uh, the, the, the community, that we can create value for them. Mm -hmm. and then the second phase that way, how to redistribute our resources of society to build a mechanism or build or organization like uh, Arctic Council. What are the function will be added in that council? Mm. And the working group in the Arctic Council can f find more knowledge there. 
Then at the, the, some, the international regime was implemented, the scientists can work as the find the feedback to review the ob further observation about their science uh, uh, assumption is right or not. Mm. So such a kind of the, the different phases, knowledge can play different roles. Yeah, well, I like the, <laughs> the, the, the notion that, that knowledge represents value. That, that seems to me a very positive and important way of looking at it. Uh, you like value because you're a businessman. You, you love a bit of value, <laughs> and, and more than I anything, do. you love a bit of profit too. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> to what extent is business today, do you think, not just in Norway, but, but as we're here in Norway, I'm intrigued to hear it from you. To what extent are you now closely working with science? You talked about openness and transparency and, and wanting to be driven by the best scientific knowledge in, in your field, which is obviously uh, seafood production and, and coastal resource uh, investment. Has, has your business shifted over time? I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah. To be much more aware of the latest knowledge and much more reactive and responsive to the latest science and knowledge. Yeah, yeah I think definitely. I mean, at least let's stick to seafood business, mm. uh, which I know best. Uh, our realization is that the interaction that we have with the environment, for instance, our, our marine environment, uh, that, that is very crucial for our profit. That has been increasing dramatically over the last uh, uh, couple of years. Uh, that we need to understand better, that we be need better models for, for currency, no, for, for, no, for currency, for currents. We need better models for how, how plankton moves, how viruses moves, how sea lice moves. Uh, we need to understand how we can make uh, our fish stronger to meet that environment. Uh, and we need to understand better how we can avoid damaging, for instance, the, the wild salmon population uh, in the areas that we operate. And all this uh, uh, knowledge uh, has to be established, and we are doing research, obviously, uh, as, we, as, we, as we go what, along. What, what happens in your boardroom when it comes to a, a, a discussion about something concrete? You know, you've, you've seen from the data that, that something you're doing, which is highly profitable, mm is actually uh, environmentally damaging in one way or another. To what extent is there a dilemma there for you as a businessman with shareholders? I don't know if you're a public company, but we are. you are, so you have shareholders to answer to. Uh, how difficult is that dilemma about balancing profitability against environmental responsibility? Actually, it is not that difficult. I, I think uh, our values come first, and then the profits come afterwards. Uh, I think we need to have a value-based business. Uh, this is at least what we are working with in our group, not only in seafood, but in other business sectors that we are engaged. Values are our basis. We are working in OSR, a, a family-based uh, organization, a family-based company uh, for 130 years, and we like to deliver the, the business and the planet better than it was uh, which is difficult, of course. Uh, maybe the business is better. The planet, uh, for mm -hmm. sure, uh, has a challenge. Uh, and we realize that. So in all our, this is now shifting in our, our reporting, for instance. Now we are specifically targeting uh, uh, development goals, uh, uh, sustainability goals in our financial reporting, uh, mm -hmm. which I think will be leading to more focus on, 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 on this sort of issue. Ingrid, do you buy that? I mean, I'm not entirely surprised uh, that Per would say that, <laughs> that. In his boardroom, you know, in the end, values come first. It, yeah. It's not the biggest surprise in the world that he puts it that way. Do you buy it? Well, I, I do think that they think in that way. And then the challenge, I think, is to understand that science is an iterative process, so you will always have new science and you'll always have to adapt. Uh, and actually, I think maybe to some degree, businesses are actually better than that, uh, than politicians are. Right. Yeah. Uh, because they have to adapt and make new profits all the time, but politicians, they have at least four years until they have to yeah. make uh, a profit again. Point. Yeah, but it's also different because you're dealing in a, an industry and a business based upon a renewable and sustainable resource. Mm. It's very different, I think, in, in the boardroom of those that deal in an industry where it's a non-renewable resource. Um, there probably is a, a very, very different dynamic. And so when you talk about the values that you discuss in the boardroom, uh, they're based upon maintaining that renewable and sustainable resource so that you can continue to meet the bottom line and be responsive not only to 
the need for profits, but also the values. I just wanted to say in response to um, uh, the comments made by our colleague here about um, the possible disconnect between science and um, the average person. Mm. I think that uh, indigenous knowledge and the production of knowledge and the co-production, co-production of knowledge would be very helpful and uh, provide some instruction to everyone about how to um, ensure that uh, the, the data, the information that is collected and analyzed in a critical fashion by scientists is much more digestible to the average person. I think there's an opportunity for uh, indigenous knowledge and co-production of knowledge to aid us in understanding the value of science, the value of indigenous knowledge. But do you think scientists but, don't really get it? They, they, they've struggled to but, understand when you talk about the power of indigenous knowledge, do you think scientists look at you and, and might sort of nod their heads sympathetically but don't really get it? Generally speaking, this is too often true. However, uh, what we're seeing certainly within the Arctic Council and this wide array of working groups is um, a, a willingness to acknowledge and, and um, give legitimacy, not, we need more of this in the Arctic Council, but, but also um, respecting and recognizing what indigenous peoples offer. I mean, indeed, it's in the Ottawa Declaration of the, of the Arctic Council, but um, moreover, the, for example... Can I, can I just interrupt for a sec? Do you not also need to focus on getting more indigenous peoples into the scientific, you know, the, what we might call the, the sort of mainstream scientific community, i.e. encouraging more and more indigenous people to, to uh, be themselves there's involved in, in There's in no question, there's science. no question about that, but there's also, in my view, a burden upon scientists and the scientific community, especially in academic institutions and research institutions, to uh, do some outreach and integrate indigenous uh, uh, worldviews and perspectives and knowledge into the work that they're undertaking. Well, that, that, that's a I great point. Well, that's what I wanted to say yeah. about the Arctic Council is that more recently we've seen, um, in fact, at the, the the most recent senior Arctic official meetings and the reports from the chairs of the working groups, a a way to um, share and reveal the information that they've received in a fashion that was digestible by everybody, uh, including, uh, well, hopefully the politicians. It was quite interesting, actually, that the uh, reports on fish stocks uh, were put into essentially a market economy picture that here, here's, here's how devastated the industry could become mm. if they continued down this path. It's like, well, that should get some attention mm -hmm. uh, as far as industry is concerned. Um, I, I want, John Anna, I just want to be, I, li I like being as specific as possible. So there you sit, you're the chief executive of the Research Council of Norway, which sounds like a very estimable body. But taking on board what Dali said, do you have formal uh, sort of ways in which you incorporate indigenous knowledge into the work of the Research Council? Mm -hmm. Can I, I will address that, but first just to comment on... Well, hang on, that's, uh, no, yeah. uh, that's the, if you were a politician, then that would answer, <laughs> <laughs> might work, but you're not a politician. It's a very simple yes or no answer. Do you, do you have ways at the Research Council of Norway of incorporating indigenous knowledge into your body of work? Yeah, research? we do. We, do. we have a specific uh, program on uh, Sami-related research, uh, where this is, of course, very integrated and, and a part of the overall program structure and the decision-making. <coughs> Uh, but to be, to be honest, I, I wouldn't differentiate necessarily between indigenous people and other people. Uh, I think we, we, there is a commonality in actually involving people. Uh, mm. And that the commoner, the, the, the general public, us all, uh, in research. And I, and I think um, that, is, that is should go alongside. And in, in, in the Arctic, we have indigenous people, we have other people. I think to actually involve local people indigenous and others uh, in deciding what are the most important research questions, understanding their often tacit knowledge, knowledge that is not codified, indigenous people has that knowledge, but also other people, fishermen in, in, uh, and, and in industries in Norway. We need to understand better their needs. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and this is the bridge, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm skipping you, because this is the bridge to, I just wanted to comment on mm -hmm. the two examples, because co-production of knowledge can be between be between people and scientists, but it can also be between 
be between scientists of different flavors, mm -hmm. different backgrounds, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. disciplines. Yeah. And, and of course, we have within science, we have people really trained as conversationists and in ecology on the one side. And then we have other scientists trained in, in fishery and, and in aquaculture. We are, as a research council, bringing different scientists together. And, we, and two examples, we have one large project on uh, quant escape, which is quantifying the potential escape of farmed salmon into the wild. And, mm. and what are the effects of, on the genetic uh, composition? What are, what are the effects of an ecology? That's one example. Another example is, there is it's in a way a battle or a, a potential fight between uh, local uh, cod uh, fishermen and, and the, the, the salmon farming industry. At least there has been some beliefs that there may be interactions here that they, they are concerned about. Mm. So what we do then is to bring these perspectives together. And, and we had a big call now, and we've just funded a project where we will look much more in detail prospectively on the impact of salmon farming on the cod breeding and population in fjords here in, in, in the Arctic. And I think that's, that's sort of bringing then different scientists together and actually needing to do that project together across different disciplines, across different backgrounds is also important. And across it? national borders. And across national borders, yeah. absolutely. May I have the uh, perspective on the traditional knowledge? You may. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think the traditional knowledge is not uh, accessory to the modern knowledge. Uh, a traditional knowledge is not only the knowledge for the daily life of the indigenous mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I think that based on the uh, experience, uh, generation to generation, that's mm -hmm. uh, based on observation about the relation between human being and the nature. Uh, I want to give an example about the China traditional knowledge. One of the knowledge is that the Chinese traditional medicine and acupuncture. Mm. Uh, the, the, that's the philosophy for China's way to treat human this body. That's a treat the human body like a system. They, the best, uh, what's the healthy mean? That's the health means the uh, keep the balance of your body. That means healthy. Mm. Use the uh, uh, most natural way to restore your balance. That's the <laughs> core philosophy. That's the so when China introduced uh, Western uh, medical. Uh, me medical the medicine that the medical college now you can find in medical college in China they each of students have to have a course called uh, traditional medicine as a methodology mm -hmm. that's the big take in, take in, uh, uh, change it as a core of the science of that mm -hmm. so combine it together this physician was encouraged to do some the combined treatment to that mm -hmm. I think that's a very similarity between the uh, traditional not the Arctic and that. Mm. Yeah, Based right. on it. you're mm. nodding approvingly, so that's good. But yeah. uh, just, uh, Ingrid's dying. I know she's dying to say something. So we'll get, and then we're going to open it up to audience discussion. So Ingrid, go on. Well, thank you. I, that's actually a really good point, I think. And and if we were able to think about the body as a system, we should be able to think about our planet and our ecosystems as, system. mm. as systems as well. And one of the challenges we have with traditional science, the way we have it today, is perhaps that we become so much experts in our fields of expertise. And like Yonana not, uh, says, not many have been speaking so much together, so we haven't been able to treat ecosystems the way they should be, gathering science, uh, science across different disciplines to really give decision makers what they need to make uh, decisions that are good for the whole system. Mm. Uh, mm. Aquaculture is treated as one kind of science, and then you have different kinds of science, but it's not uh, integrated. So that is a challenge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you want to say something? Before? Yeah. Yep, go yeah, on. I quick, yeah. Quick, quick. Uh, very quick. <laughs> quick, quick. Mm. No, I just build it a, a little bit on what you're saying. I think we are, it's, it's a very complicated world, and it becomes more complicated. And I think people have a tendency to retract to their own silos of expertise in mm. a way, mm -hmm. whether it's within business or science or politics or, or whatever you do in your life. Uh, and then cross it, going out of those silos, it's quite hard because things are so complex and you get met with so much information that's very hard to digest. So I, I think all of us living in silos need to get out there and try to understand much uh, better the, what are the values that are driving those other groups. Uh, I mean, for instance, like, like as I said in my presentation, business people are a little bit shy of coming out because we are so good at what we do, but we don't 
want others to, in a way, interfere with us. Well, one of the interesting, uh, again, I'm beginning to become very boring, banging on about Brexit and the debate we've had, but one of the interesting things about that debate is the degree to which, uh, in the use of information, there is always the desire to sort of, particularly uh, amongst supposedly objective, impartial journalism organizations like the mm -hmm. BBC, there's always a desire to sort of put both sides of the story. Mm -hmm. So when it comes, for example, to an analysis of the, of the economic impacts of Brexit, you know, there, frankly, there is a, a preponderance of expert opinion on one side, which says it's going to be very damaging and it's going to be painful, and here's how. And then there are some, a s very much smaller number of economists on the other side, saying, you know what, actually there are huge opportunities here and the British economy is resilient and will cope quite well and it won't be so damaging to growth. And the temptation is to, because, you know, you feel the duty to reflect a debate, you sort of give equal airtime and equivalence to both mm -hmm. sides, when in mm -hmm. fact, one side has the preponderance of opinion and the other has very little opinion. Mm. And, and that's, that's both understandable but potentially confusing and possibly dangerous to the quality of the debate. Mm. Do you think that applies here in the Arctic to some of the discussions you have, that there is a desire to put both sides in a way which suggests equivalence when there isn't necessarily equivalence? I think we definitely see that in, in Norwegian media as well. Uh, two examples. One is on vaccines, vaccination. We tend to, we have a strong body of evidence on the value of vaccination, but still, and there's a small minority uh, who have other beliefs, uh, but they get equal sort of right. uh, roles in a debate. And on, in the same on climate science, we, of course, there's a preponderance uh, of scientists across the board that uh, have. Um, of course, there are lots of uncertainties, but at least they have a commonality, they have common models, they have common understanding, and then there is a small minority, and they tend to get the same voice as well. And, and that we actually see in the, in the trust to science, because yeah. on climate issues, our, we, we do polls uh, every second year to, to see how, what, what is the trust of the general public in, in science. Um, and we see an increasing uh, proportion of the public believing that scientists are actually bias towards their own beliefs and, so and their trust, ideology. Trust and in levels particular, are declining. Yeah, and in particular well, on climate know, science. It's a, great, it's yeah. a very serious problem, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to I, actually bring our, everybody in now, because uh, we've got a bit of time, and so I want hands up and any thoughts, quest particularly questions on this subject. I wanted, uh, is, is it possible just to make two, two points beforehand well, uh, uh, that relate it, it to the possible, line of question? It is possible, because I can't um, really stop you, but make yeah. them, make them <laughs> um, First of all, I, I I accept what you've said about uh, inclusion and, and, and the inclusiveness and the importance of it, but I also want to underscore that there is a distinction in terms of the, uh, the knowledge that indigenous peoples have to offer, especially uh, basically on, on the basis of the longevity and, their, and this profound relationship with the Arctic environment. But secondly, and I think even more important, is that um, uh, there, your institute is it, an, is it a state institute, a no, national? It's, it's, it's the National Research Funding Organization. Ah, okay. So, to some extent, you probably have a legal obligation to be responsive to indigenous peoples. Uh, there, there are solemn commitments that governments have made to uh, respect and recognize uh, the rights of indigenous peoples, including indigenous knowledge. So, um, I think it's, I'm, I'm just appealing to everybody mm. about uh, that there is a distinction, but the importance of the contributions that indigenous peoples can make through indigenous knowledge. And I think that governments in particular, and government institutions, academic and otherwise, research institutions, do have a solemn obligation to be responsive to indigenous peoples and what they have to offer. All right, well, Dali, thank you for that. Uh, I know, yes, you, ma'am, you go first, because you've got the microphone. Yes, oh, sorry. Thank you. My name is Gunbrit Retter. I'm head of Arctic and Environmental Unit of the Sami Council. And my question was exactly where Daly was ending here. Uh, it was about if you see any distinction between local and public knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what uh, Daly, uh, part of her in, uh, presentation was exactly that. It's also about how you govern yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, the indigenous knowledge as I see it, is also the way you govern yourself in your daily business and life, and this is what needs to be recognized. Mm. And my uh, claim or statement is that local and public knowledge, they 
uh, I recognize that this is a val very valuable knowledge system as well, but I also would say they have uh, they are organized in a way th through farmers' associations, fishermen's associations that have access to, to labor organizations in Norway or to the science uh, foundations and so on. So there is a system where you actually take care of this knowledge in, no in Norway. And I assume science programs and so on, uh, they are not made out of blue. They are made um, based on the local knowledge that is come through the organization you have in place. And the indigenous knowledge is not recognized the same way, but it's getting better. All so right. I would just the question is if you see that distinction. Well, that I, I, yeah, we'll hold that thought. I mean, I think uh, uh, Daly has, has sort of addressed quite a lot of that already, but let's get a couple more thoughts or questions from the floor uh, where we see them. Uh, there's a hand up over there. So can we get a microphone over there? And uh, is there anybody? Oh, then there's, can we get a mic? Do we have two microphones? Uh, I, I hope we do. No, Hello. I'm not sure we do. Anyway, Hi. yes, you go, and then we'll get over there. Hi, I'm Christine Sin. I'm from a media arts organization in Tromsø called Ice Nine. Uh, we're working to try and get people to collectively imagine the future. So we put together artists with scientists, uh, youth. The question, I was really happy to hear that the Norwegian Research Council is interested in getting um, local people, uh, non-specialists essentially, uh, to, um, to share their knowledge and also influence the priorities of the Research Council. What are the best forums right now for non-specialists to be in a kind of informed engagement with the Research Council or the Fishing uh, Sustainability Council or, or, the, or the indigenous councils that are here uh, focusing on certain issues. But let's say you're a non-specialist, you're interested, maybe you need a little information, but you also want to communicate your own uh, sense of priorities and, and how you filter that information. Where, where are the forums that are most successful right now in, in having those informed conversations with non-specialists. Right, yeah, this is all about the most effective forms of communication and, and then building trust so that people at all levels do believe decisions, you know, based on the science, but they're being made with an appreciation of, of ordinary people's sort of input and understanding of what the implications might be. So are there forums in all of your walks of life where quote unquote ordinary people are consulted and carried along in, in the process of, you know, making decisions? So because uh, I, I read the question to be about whether we can actually include those perspectives early on in the mm. knowledge production process. Mm. Uh, because then, of course, you also need to integrate it in decision making. Uh, we, we need to be, become much better on that. We are now actually uh, developing a, a broader policy on, on open science where, where actually citizen science and involvement is one part. But we have already dismissed it because I can imagine some scientists would sit up here saying, oh, come on, you know, we, we, we've invested our whole careers in developing a, a, an expertise and a knowledge base. You know, it's ridiculous to expect us to <laughs> in, incorporate the feelings and views of ordinary folk who don't have our knowledge. But we, we have done that on a couple of areas. We've done it within climate science. We had a, an engagement with the citizens on, on what are the most important issues, and we used that to, 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 to formulate our call for proposals within that. And, and then uh, within uh, medicine, there, there is a strong sort of concern about uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and, and other names of the same sort of condition. Uh, and we really involved uh, all different patients groups that have very different views on what is important, but we brought them together. So I, th I think we need to continue with those sort of examples and expand. Uh, and I should also say, uh, just to address her comment and, and a question from the floor, uh, definitely there are special rights and special needs to, to listen and integrate the, the, the voice of indigenous mm. people just bef because of the, the reason she pointed out. And we will launch our third iteration of our strategy on research for the northern region later today, and, and that is one of the cross-cutting issues, uh, the, the, the role and, and the perspectives of indigenous people. Okay, well, people will look out for that. We're just going to take one more question, then we're going to change shift panel members a little bit. Go on, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is a comment, really. Uh, my name is Hans Korell. I'm of Swedish nationality. 
but I'm speaking in my capacity as the Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs uh, and the Legal Council of the United Nations between 94 and 2004. One of my responsibilities was the law of the sea. When Rector Husebeck addressed us yesterday, she mentioned the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. One of these goals is essential to achieve all the others. Goal 16 on equal justice for all, mm -hmm. with the targets rule of law and also anti-corruption. Mm -hmm. And one important element in the rule of law is international law. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to um, Senator Murkowski in the pause here, I mentioned to her that the US is not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention, mm -hmm. which is the legal regime that applies in the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. All the other seven Arctic states are. And my hope would be that also the US would ratify the Law of the Sea Convention, mm -hmm. which would mean that they would have a judge on the Law of the Sea Tribunal in Hamburg, on the Seabed Authority in Kingston, Jamaica, and the Continental Shelf Commission that works from New York. So that would be an appeal on my part to try to convince the US. They are, in fact, following the rules of the Law of the Sea Convention, but they should demonstrate, but also being a party to the Law of the Sea Convention. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, well, that, that was clear. I'm not, I, I think at this point, as chairman, I'm going to have to be a little bit disciplined and say we've actually reached time where we need to switch over our panel a little bit. So thank you for that comment, Hans, but uh, we're going to take your, your perspective on that and that we're going to just focus now on, on changing perspective a little bit. Not entirely. We're still dealing with the, the power of knowledge theme, but we're changing our panel. So uh, again, as elegantly as I can, I'm going to invite... Uh, our panelists who are leaving us to leave the stage now, that is Per Grieg, Yang Jian, and Ingrid Lomelde. So thank all of them very much for their participation. And